The dying, Joe, you can't do that to people. You but just you can't. Can. Take a look at New York and what's happened to my wonderful city for, for so many years. I loved it. It was vibrant. It's dying. Everyone's leaving New York. Take a look Vice at President what Biden. New York has done in terms of the, turning the curve down in terms of the number of people dying. And I don't look at this in terms of the way he does blue states and red states. They're all the United States. And look at the states that are having such a spike in the coronavirus. They're the red states. They're the states in the Midwest. They're the states in the upper Midwest. That's where the spike is occurring significantly. But they're all Americans. They're all Americans. And what we have to do is say, wear these masks, number one, make sure we get the help that the businesses need that has money's already been passed to do that. It's been out there since the beginning of the summer, and nothing's happened. President, New York has lost more than 40,000 people, 11,000 people in nursing homes. President Trump, what when about— When you say spike, take a look at what's happening in Pennsylvania. If I lived in New York, I'd probably want to leave, or I would leave if possible. Just like if I lived in L.A., I'd want to live somewhere like where I live now, especially if I had the opportunity to work remotely. So the problem is— not everyone can work remotely, and like Joe's suggesting, um, we should find ways for people to be able to continue working. Because um, in New York, the some of the hardest hit people right now are the low wage workers, the illegal immigrants, the legal immigrants that work in the restaurant industry, the the dishwashers, uh, the busboys. Um, they're having a lot of trouble surviving. So, I agree. We need to figure out some way to find balance. Um, for the most part, I think people need to take food to go. And we, as leaders, need to step up and make sure that people are taken care of. And that's why I've talked about creating a second currency that is like food stamps, but it's also for essentials. Like if you want Tylenol, you could use the second currency. If you want um, Aleve, you could use a second currency. If you need Zyrtec or if you need Claritin, like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about pain medicine or, or, or allergy medicine or um, even basic first aid. Uh, I think that's an essential. I think tampons are essential. Um, so this second currency could be used for essentials. It could also be used for buying used goods. So if you want to buy something from the pawn shop, you can buy it. Because I have no problem with us spending money and stimulating the economy as long as we're not consuming. And if you're buying a used good, you're not consuming because it's not being manufactured. You're just kind of picking it up. Maybe you, you consumed to take to, to, to use gas on the way to buy the item, but for the most part, you're not really uh, consuming like uh, because you're not getting the item from a Chinese factory or from a wherever factory. So I've talked about how we need to make sure people are taken care of. We need to worry about the environment at the same time because the second currency, you wouldn't be able to use it for gas, I guarantee it. And um, we need to make sure people are fed. We need to make sure people aren't homeless. We need to make sure people have a way to be safe if the coronavirus is knocking on their doorstep. And um, so that's why when we keep talking about um, opening up schools in places like New York, I'm like, are you nuts? Take a look at what's happening in Pennsylvania, where they've had it closed. Take a look at what's happening with your friend in Michigan, where her husband's the only one allowed to do anything. It's been like a prison. Now it was just ruled unconstitutional. Take a look at North Carolina. They're having spikes, and they've been closed, and they're getting killed financially. We can't let that happen, Joe. You can't let that happen. We have to open up, and we understand the disease. We have to protect our seniors. We have to protect our elderly. We have to protect especially our seniors with heart problems and diabetes problems, and we will protect them. We have the best testing in the world by far. That's why we have so many cases. Let me follow up with you jokes. before we move on to our next section. President Trump, this week you called Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's best known infectious disease expert, quote, a disaster. You described him and other medical experts as, quote, idiots. If you're not listening to them, who are you listening to? Let, let me, I'm listening to all of them, including Anthony. I get along very well with Anthony, but he did say, don't wear masks. He did say, as you know, this is not going to be a problem. Uh, I think he's a Democrat, but that's okay. He said, this is not going to be a problem. We are not going to have a problem at all. When Joe says that I said, Anthony Fauci said, and others, and many others, and I'm not knocking him a lot. Nobody knew. Look, nobody knew what this thing was. Nobody knew where it was coming from, what it was. We've learned a lot. 
But Anthony said, don't wear masks. Now he wants to wear masks. Anthony also said, if you look back, exact words. Here's his exact words. This is no problem. This is Dr. Fauci was concerned that he didn't have enough masks for everyone to wear. And he wanted everyone to have surgeon's masks. Because Dr. Fauci, maybe he's not someone that thinks outside the box. Or maybe just in that situation, he wasn't thinking outside the box because he's old. And I complained about it in the beginning. I was like, all right, is everybody you're bringing in to solve the problem 80 years old? No one recently went to medical school. No one recently learned the newest technology. You want to bring in the guy who is old school. So, I mean, I guess it was a group decision to bring him in. I don't know. What I do know is he didn't not want people to wear masks. He just didn't know how to get people masks because there was no way to manufacture enough of them. This is no problem. This is going to go away soon. So he's allowed to make mistakes. He happens to be a good person. Vice President right. Biden, your response quickly, and then we're going to move on to the next section. My response is that think about what the president knew in January and didn't tell the American people. He was told this was a serious virus that spread in the air, and it was much worse than, much worse than the flu. He went on record and said to one of your colleagues, recorded, that in fact he knew how dangerous it was, but he didn't want to tell us. He didn't want to tell us because he didn't want us to panic. He didn't want us, Americans don't panic. He panicked. But guess what? In the meantime, we find out in the New York Times the other day that in fact his folks went to Wall Street and said this is a really dangerous thing, and a memo out of that meeting, not from his administration, but from some of the brokers said, sell short because we got to get moving. It's a dangerous problem. Well, this is I'm going to give you 30 seconds to respond. I'm going to respond real quick. So this whole sell short thing, do you think it's been good for American corporations? That, okay, I, I know everyone's going, what? What does that mean? Joe is saying that Donald encouraged people to um, bet against the American stock market. And that means that they bought our stock with the assumption that it's going to go down. And um, there's a, I think there's a limit for how much you can go down in a day. But uh, what I'm saying is um, that he, he, he's saying that he encouraged people to do that. And in my opinion, it was kind of common sense that um, the virus was going to affect the stock market. So it was common sense that there was going to be a sell-off. But what actually happened is a lot of people went short and that helped us. Because some, because, because, because certain people that have a lot of money, not me, but like certain Americans that have a lot of money really enjoy when there are a bunch of people betting against the stock market. Because if the market goes up, every bit that the market goes up, as long as they can cover the short, that's profit. That person just increased their stock value and they didn't have to spend any money to increase the stock value because all they had to do was have enough money in the bank to cover the value of the stock. So all I'm saying is, um, I think we've made lemonade out of lemons with the stock market. Um, I think a lot of people are really confused by how the economy is still going. Obviously, there are a lot of people that really, really, really need help. And we need to not look at the economy as far as uh, a stock market problem. I think we need to think of the economy as a c consumer price index problem, which is the price of things. Like how much is the price of milk? How much is the price of eggs? How much is the price of bread? How much is it to have a house? Um, how much is it to rent an apartment where you live? How, how much do you get paid where you live relative to that? Uh, how much do the restaurants, like how much do you have to pay for food? Um, like, are, are you living in, in, in a pretty reasonable situation or are you like completely screwed? Because in some countries, you're screwed um, just by existing because the price of things are so expensive. It's not about the stock market. It's about the price of things. And then we're uh, the Wall Street move one, on. I don't know. Somebody went to Wall Street. You're the one that takes all the money from Wall Street. I don't take it. Joe, I have. You, you have raised a lot of money, tremendous amounts of money. And every time you raise money, deals are made, Joe. I could raise so much more money oh. as president and as somebody that knows most of those people. I could call the heads of Wall Street, the heads of every company in America. I would blow away every record, but I don't want to do that because it puts me in a bad position. And then you bring up Wall Street. You shouldn't be bringing up Wall Street because you're the one that takes the money from Wall Street, not me. My I, could, I could blow away your records that, like, you wouldn't believe. We don't need money. We have plenty of money. In fact, 
We beat Hillary Clinton with a tiny fraction of the money that she was able to. All right, to gentlemen, we're going to move on. Don't tell me about Average contribution, $43. All right, we're going to move on to our next section, which is national security. And I do want to start with the security of our elections and some breaking news from overnight. Just last night, top intelligence officials confirmed again that both Russia and Iran are working to influence this election. Both countries have obtained U.S. voter registration information, these officials say, and Iran sent intimidating messages to Florida voters. This question goes to you, Mr. Vice President. What would you do to put an end to this threat? You have two minutes uninterrupted. I made it clear, and I ask everyone else to take the pledge, I made it clear that any country, no matter who it is, that interferes in American elections will pay a price. They will pay a price. And it's been overwhelmingly clear this election, I won't even get into the last one, this election, that Russia has been involved, China has been involved to some degree, and now we learn that, that, uh, that uh, Iran is involved. They will pay a price if I'm elected. They're interfering with American sovereignty. That's what's going on right now. They're interfering with American sovereignty. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think the president said anything to Putin about it. I don't think he's talking to them a lot. I don't think he said a word. I don't know why he hadn't said a word to Putin about it. And I don't know what he has recently said, if anything, to the Iranians. Number one, what's the point in talking to Putin? We should worry about election security with, um, by, by making our technology impenetrable. And I believe we can do that. And you can say, well, they're hacking our election, blah, 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 blah. They're hacking voting machines. In my opinion, if they're hacking voting machines, there's a serious problem because a voting machine shouldn't be something that you have um, ways to input malicious data at. Like you shouldn't be able to um, try to cause a buffer overflow. So um, the, 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 the voting machine should be like, this is what you do. And that voting data should be secure. And that's why I've talked about how we need to um, secure our data by um, having allowing everyone to check their data together by hashing. And your vote should be, uh, I don't want to explain it, but um, I talked about using blockchain, which means uh, making the votes public, but also hiding the votes, obfuscating the votes. So we don't know who's voting, but you can still look up your vote and see who you voted for. Um, so, um, I think we need to take care of it ourselves. I don't think talking to Vladimir Putin is going to do it, but let's face it, who's Vladimir Putin for? I think we all know. My guess is he'd probably be more outspoken with regard to the Iranians. But the point is this, folks. We are in a situation where we have foreign company countries trying to interfere in the outcome of our election. His old, own national security advisor told him that what is happening with his buddy — well, I, won't, I shouldn't — well, I will. His buddy, Rudy Giuliani, he's being used as a Russian pawn. He's being fed information that is Russian — that is not true. And then what happens? Nothing happens. And then you find out that everything that's going on here about Russia is wanting to make sure that I do not get elected the next president of the United States because they know I know them and they know me. I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? Any country that interferes with us will, in fact, pay a price because they're affecting our sovereignty. President Trump. Same question to you. To let, me a, let me ask the yes. question. You're going to have two minutes yeah. to respond. For two elections in a row now, there has been substantial interference from foreign adversaries. What would you do in your next term to put an end to this? Two minutes uninterrupted. Well, let me respond to the first part, as Joe answered. Joe got $3.5 million from Russia, and it came through Putin because he was very friendly with the former mayor of Moscow, and it was the mayor of Moscow's wife. And you got $3.5 million. Your family got $3.5 million. And you know, someday you're going to have to explain why did you get three and a half. I never got any money from Russia. I don't get money from Russia. Now, about your thing last night, I knew all about that. And through John, who is John Retliff, who is fantastic, DNI, he said the one thing that's common to both of them, they both want you to lose because there has been nobody tougher to Russia with between the sanctions. I saw how you treated Vladimir Putin at the press conference after you got elected, and you basically offered to give him fellatio. And so you can say, oh, no, it's been harder in Russia about me. No, 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 no. I've never seen a president bow down to Vladimir Putin like that. 
And so I think that's important for people to know. What I also think is important for people to know is that it's very difficult to get out of some countries. And so if I want to move out of the United States, I'm a wealthy person, but I don't have a lot of money in, in my bank account, it's difficult for me to move out of the United States because you need money. And if you're in another country, it's even harder because think about what $1,000 is to someone in Central America. $1,000 is half the money they make in a year or maybe one quarter of the money they make in a year. And um, they have to pay for rent and all that stuff. And life can get really expensive. Like I was talking about the consumer price index. The consumer price index in some countries is, is, is very difficult. Like if you buy a can of Dr. Pepper in, in, in Egypt, it's like... It's like, um, it's at least six Guinea, which is like, um, it's like a dollar or it's like, it's like, but like, I'm just saying like, if you buy a Coke, it's like 18 cents. But so like for them, like uh, uh, buying a Dr. Pepper is really expensive because it's imported. So all I'm saying is, um, money's not the same everywhere. And what, uh, and also what I'm saying is Russia has a lot of models and this guy likes models and he sure likes Russians a lot. And I've never seen someone with so many freaking Russian ex-wives. And all I'm saying is this guy has this serious, serious connection to Russia. But more than anything, he has a serious connection to the Soviet freaking Union. And I know that one, he doesn't have Russian ex-wives. He has Soviet ex-wives. He's got Czech or whatever. And like, yes, yes, um, he does have Soviet ex-wives. And I actually was planning on including the Czech Republic in my um, war plans for World War III. Uh, I don't know if I was planning on including Slovenia. I haven't really thought about them because they're so small. But I'm definitely not planning on having Russia in. But what I do know is the USSR and the KGB wasn't a Russia organization. It was a Soviet organization. And I think a lot of us need to ask some questions about, like, why is Donald Trump so Soviet connected? Because me, I'm not into that Soviet shit. Pardon me. I'm not into that. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not into this gangster stuff. I know everyone thinks I'm a, that I start sounding gangster sometimes, but like what I'm telling you is my people are definitely not Soviet. We will accept the Soviets if they come to the United States during World War III and they make it here and then they join our military. They can do that, but they have to make it here and um, they have to fight their way here and that's a way of preventing um, complete nuclear destruction. There's nobody tougher than me on Russia. Between the sanctions, between all of what I've done with NATO, you know, I've got the NATO countries to put up an extra $130 billion, going to $420 billion a year. That's to guard against Russia. I sold, while he was selling pillows and sheets, I sold tank busters to Ukraine. There has been nobody tougher than, on Russia than Donald Trump. And I'll tell you, they were so bad. They took over the, the submarine port. You remember that very well. During your term, during you and Barack Obama, they took over a big part of what should have been Ukraine. You handed it to them, but you were getting a lot of money. What he's talking about is how Russia took over Crimea, which Crimea has a major submarine port, which can be used during World War III. So this was like a very bad situation for a country that's fighting Russia. So it was, it was, it was bad for us militarily, but it wasn't that bad, but it was bad, but we know where the submarine base is and that's the good part. But the reality is Ukraine's not our ally and Donald Trump sure seems to be influenced by Ukraine a lot. And, um, Ukraine isn't our, isn't, isn't in NATO at all. And, um, that wasn't quite the Obama Obama administration's fault because um, the Ukraine isn't an ally of ours. But you were getting a lot of money from Russia. They were paying you a lot of money, and they probably still are. But now, with what came out today, it's even worse. All of the emails, the emails, the horrible emails of the kind of money that you were raking in, you and your family. And Joe, you were vice president when some of this was happening. And it should have never happened. And I think you owe an explanation to the American people. Why is it? Somebody just had a news conference a little while ago who was essentially supposed to work with you and your family. But what he said was damning. And regardless of me, I think you have to clean it up and talk to the American people. Maybe you can do it right now. Vice President Biden, you may respond. In 30 seconds. Here. And then I do I, want to follow up on the election security. I have not taken a penny from any foreign source ever in my life. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, and in fact is talking about me taking money. 
I have not taken a single penny from any country whatsoever, ever, number one. Number two, this is a president. I have released all of my tax returns, 22 years. Go look at them, 22 years of my tax return. You have not released a single solitary year of your tax return. What are you hiding? Why are you unwilling? The foreign countries are paying you a lot. Russia's paying you a lot. China's paying you a lot. And your hotels and all your businesses all around the country, all around the world. And China's building a new road to a new ga a, a, a golf course you have overseas. So what's going on here? Why don't release your tax return or stop talking about corruption? President Trump, your response. First of all, I called my accountants, underwrote it. I'm going to release them as soon as we can. I want to do it. And it'll show how successful, how great this company is. But much more importantly than that, people were saying $750. I asked them a week ago, I said, what did I pay? They said, sir, you prepaid tens of millions of dollars. I prepaid my tax. Tens over the last number of years. Tens of millions of dollars I prepaid. Because at some point they think it's an estimate. They think I may have to pay tax. So I already prepaid it. Nobody told me that. Did your account Nobody tell told you, you that. You Excuse them? me. And it wasn't written whenever they write this. They keep talking about $750, which I think is a filing fee. But let me just tell you, I prepaid millions and millions of dollars in taxes, number one. Number two, I don't make money from China. You do. I don't make money from Ukraine. You do. I don't make money from Russia. You made three and a half million dollars, Joe, and your son gave you. They even have a statement that we have to give 10 percent. Russia. I'm sorry, but the sound of your voice made it sound like you were lying there for a second. So the real question that a lot of people have on their minds is, um, if you're in the gambling business and you're, which means uh, you're in the casino business, casinos are very well known places to do money laundering because they're the best. My dad won a million dollar jackpot at a casino once. And so all I'm saying is it's a very, very common thing. And so the question is, who are you laundering money for? And the answer can be a lot of different answers. Um, but they could be for drugs or for weapons or for a foreign government because the foreign government wants to be able to get into the American um, economy and they will pump money into a business so that the business is successful even when it's not successful. Um, so a lot of people, because of this whole VPN from, tr uh, from when you're Trump Towers to Moscow, um, believe that maybe um, you're rich because of Russia. So would you like to talk about why you have suspicious internet connections to Russia? I I'm guessing no. Let's, we'll see. Percent to the big man. You're the big man, I think. I don't know. Maybe you're not. But you're the big man, I think. You sense that we have to give 10 percent to the big man. Joe, what's that all about? It's terrible. All right, gentlemen, I it's want to ask you both some questions about all of this. But I'm going to let you both respond very quickly. You just said you spoke to your accountant yes. about potentially releasing your taxes. Did he tell you when you can release them? Do you as have a the deadline for when you're going to release them? I get American treated people? worse than the Tea Party got treated because I have a lot have of people in there. Yeah. Deep down in the IRS, they treat me horribly. We made a deal. It was all settled until I decide to run for president. I get treated very badly by the IRS, very unfairly. But we had a deal all done. As soon as we're completed with the deal, I want to release it. But I have paid millions and millions of dollars, and I, it's worse than paying. I paid in advance. It's called prepaying your taxes. Okay. I paid in advance. I want to ask you yep. both about questions regarding your potential foreign entanglements and questions that have been raised to give you both a chance Some to talk about this is. more broadly. Respond very quickly, and then I'll get to my question. Why did he, he's been saying this for four years? Show us. Just show us. Stop playing around. You've been saying for four Everybody years you're going to release knows. your taxes. Nobody knows it, Mr. President. What they do okay. know is you're not paying your taxes or you're paying taxes that are so low. When last time he said what he paid, he said, I only pay that little because I'm smart. I know how to game the system. Come on. Come on, folks. So, quickly, President Trump, and then I want to get to two questions to both of you sure. on this. I was put through a phony witch hunt for three years. It started before I even got elected. They spied on my campaign. No president should ever have to go through what I went through. Let me just say this. Mueller and 18 angry Democrats 
and FBI agents all over the place spent $48 million. They went through everything I had. In we all need to think about this situation real quick. I did a hunger strike because Robert Mueller was in charge of the, because, well, not because Robert Mueller, but because the FBI was doing all these terrible things to underage kids. And they were like, I mean, it was like, the Stanford prison experiment with no cameras. It was awful. You don't understand the way that the FBI has been towards people. And because of my hunger strike, Robert Mueller got fired. He was gone. The Obama administration fired him. He came back to investigate Trump. And so when I found out about that, I was like, well, Trump must be a drug dealer or something because um, this must be our people working in Congress to make make it so that he can't bust Trump for drugs. And I, I didn't understand the situation. And I think that what happened is a lot of people liked Robert Mueller and they didn't like that Robert Mueller got fired. Well, they didn't know he got fired, but they didn't like that he, he got kicked out of the FBI because Robert Mueller was around Washington, D.C. for a long time. He knows everyone. So um, they wanted to bring Robert Mueller back, but a lot of people apparently didn't understand why Robert Mueller was gone, which was because um, his agents were completely breaking the law. So they brought in this guy that, like, in my opinion, because of my knowledge of the law, because of the Wiretap Act and such, I mean, I think that Robert Mueller probably should have done some time in jail um, because of the way that he broke the law. But um, I guess Trump doesn't want to tell the whole story, does he?